Chapter 10 of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts. As the months went by and the Queen's visit receded farther into the past, Father Damien realized that help, to the amount he had hoped for, would not be forthcoming. His disappointment was deep and bitter, but he was never short-tempered with its lepers. To them, the Kamiano was always gentle and thoughtful and kind. For them, he was a fighter, a man truly worthy of the title knight in its original rather than its social meaning. As the personnel of the Board of Health changed, its policies changed. Sometimes they made and enforced rigid rules and withheld funds from Molokai. At intervals, more aid was given. This wavering was not easy for Damien to understand. From his earliest days in the colony, Damien had always used the phrase, we lepers, when speaking to his people. He had identified himself so closely with them that he was indignant when there was any stinting of efforts for their well-being. He felt that everyone should take their plight to heart as he did. To outsiders who were not moved by anything like his burning charity, his attitude lacked moderation. His devotion to his flock was often misunderstood and criticized for this reason. His bishop wrote, The government doctors come to the leprosarium only as visitors, and the few that reside there, with fat salaries, rarely stay beyond a year, broken up by numerous absences. I do not blame them in taking all precautions in their dealings with the lepers, but what right have they to blame the devoted priest for not taking the same precautions? He considered them useless since, from the first day he arrived, he generously consented to fall victim to the disease. He had consented, and his offering of himself had been accepted. For some years now, various signs had appeared to show that he might have contracted leprosy. However, the symptoms came and went. In 1884, for example, he suffered from violent pains in the left foot and leg, but the doctor diagnosed them as rheumatic symptoms. Then, late in December of that year, he reached his home one night, tired and aching from his long, wearying day. He decided to bathe his feet, hoping that this might relax him. He heated a basin of water on his little stove and carried it over to his chair where he might sit down and plunge his feet into the soothing bath. The water had seemed neither hot nor cold to him, but when he took his feet out to dry them, he saw that blisters were forming on the skin. The water had been boiling, and he had not felt it. A specialist in leprosy, Dr. Arning, was visiting the island at the time, and Damien went to him for examination. As the test proceeded, the doctor's face grew more and more grim. When he had finished, he remained silent, his eyes fixed upon some papers, which he was nervously shifting from one place on the desk to another. Come, doctor, Father Damien urged. Tell me what you found. The doctor still hesitated. Then he looked up at the strong, calm face across the desk from him. The priest smiled. I must have your report, you know, he quietly reminded the other. The two men measured each other for a further instant. Then the doctor spoke. What you think is true, he said. You have leprosy. I am not surprised, replied Damien gently. I have suspected it for a long time. Life now changed for Father Damien in many ways. He worked just as hard for just as many hours as ever. But now there was a new sense of pressure of working against time. He was completely familiar with the usual progress of the disease, knew that in all likelihood he would not have the full use of his hands for very much longer. He wrote to the new provincial in October 1885 to tell him of the situation. There is no doubt any longer, he said. I am a leper. Blessed be God. Do not pity me too much. I ask but one favor. Send me in this tomb someone who can be my confessor. Now he had two crosses the cross of knighthood, and the cross of leprosy. He carried both equally lightly. The first meant nothing to him, because it had not brought to his flock the comforts for which he had hoped. The other he ignored as far as possible. By now, the work of the Knight of Molokai was known throughout most of the world. Scores everywhere loved and venerated the big, courageous man, even though his heroism was of a kind difficult for most people to comprehend. There was real grief when word went abroad that Damien was a leper. Those who disliked him were irritated. They talked almost as though he had done this thing just to get publicity. Of course he has leprosy, they said angrily. He has been foolish and imprudent. 
by their scale of values, it was foolish of him to have gone to Malachi in the first place. It was even more foolish to have stayed. The bishop sent word, in March of 1886, that Father Damien might come at once to the leper hospital at Kakako, on the outskirts of Honolulu. Although it was called the branch hospital, it was to all intents and purposes a receiving station to which lepers were sent to await shipment to Malachi. When Father Damien had last seen it, it was a dreadful place. Nothing but a series of dirty, barn-like sheds inside a palisade on the salt marshes. It was then run like a prison, even having solitary confinement cells for disciplinary purposes. In 1883, a group of nursing nuns, whose help Damien had long desired, arrived in Honolulu on the invitation of the government. These seven Franciscan sisters had been a little startled by their reception. A gala with bands and flowers and songs, terminating in an audience with the Queen. They had taken it with outward grace, but inward impatience to get to their work in Malachi. The Board of Health, however, had other plans. Now that these dedicated women were here, they didn't propose to have them leave. The branch hospital could use them. The nuns were aghast and dismayed when they saw the hospital. It was cold, unsanitary, unstocked, and filthy. But this last condition, at any rate, was one which they personally could do something about. Mother Mary Ann, the leader of the band, was a woman with character much like Damien's own. She was a doer as well as a director, a person to take on the job at hand and carry it on to completion. She and her sisters rolled up their sleeves, got brushes and buckets of water, and set to work to make the hospital as clean and as sanitary as possible. No task, no matter how revolting, dismayed them. They had volunteered to go to Molokai, but since, for the time at least, they were to work at the branch, the branch would get all they had to give. By the time Father Damien reached there, the hospital was operating fairly well. He was to undergo a series of treatments in accord with a new method that was being followed in various parts of the world, with some apparent success. With his flock ever in mind, he was interested in learning all he could about these treatments. But at the same time, he grieved over the separation from his children and the interruption of his own work on Malachi. Father Damien and Mother Mary Ann got along well together. Both were hard workers, unsparing of themselves. Both loved, loved God and loved their fellow men, especially the afflicted. The nuns were excited at having in their charge the man whose sacrifice had directed their attention to the work to be done on the islands. All of the patients at the branch hospital got the best possible care, but this particular patient called forth every kindness they could think of, every attention they could offer. Father Damien tried to be a good patient, but though he was a grateful one, he was always uneasy. It violated all his ideas of proper living for him to be ill, and others to be waiting on him and tending him. He yearned to be back working on Malachi. Signs of his disease were visible now. His nose had begun to swell and lose its shape. His ears were becoming distorted, his complexion was taking on the typical purplish copper color of leprosy, and his eyes constantly pained him. But the worst pain of all was the worry over those he had left on Molokai. The only thing he found at all satisfying about being in the hospital was the fact that he received there, and so learned about giving, the new treatment. This had been worked out by Dr. Goto, a Japanese. It consisted of lengthy medicinal baths, combined with the taking of liquid drugs and pills. It was not supposed to be a cure, but had, in some recorded cases, arrested the progress of the disease. Damien was eager to introduce it in his leper colony. Do you think, Mother Mary Ann, he asked wistfully, after his two weeks in the hospital were over, that you can send me some nuns soon? We need them for the children particularly. I understand, Father. Leprosy is not inherited, you know, and if the children are taken into non-leprous homes, they need not become diseased but often we find that they are not treated well by the people who adopt them, and we cannot have that. We need your sisters to operate an orphanage for them, especially the little girls. I will try and see what can be done, Father. You know it is our wish to nurse and teach Amalekai. We will come as soon as the authorities allow it. You must hurry. On Father Damien's disfigured face, there shone one of his old smiles. There isn't much time, you know. End of chapter 10. Recording by Maria Therese.